All right, hello and welcome to the Off By One security stream. A uh, quick apology for the last couple of weeks I wasn't on. There was uh, some pretty significant travel and such going on, so I wasn't able to uh, get anything going. But this week I'm here with uh, guest Pedram Amini, who is an amazing individual who I've known for quite a while now. I, I first discovered Pedram's work when I was looking for the SAN Security 660 course and looking for some fuzzers to use, some reverse engineering frameworks to use. And one of the things we wanted to do was not just fuzz something, but also measure the code coverage. And when you don't have the source code and you just you can pretty much only do things like block coverage measurement. And he wrote a tool called PyMay. And there was I think it was oh, what's the name of the um, Peace Talker, right? Was it Peace Talker? Yeah. Process Docker allows you to actually record the hits at the entry points of all the different edges of the blocks, and then you could export that, load it into Ida Pro, and you could basically trace where your execution of the path it took through a program and then go and modify accordingly. So we use that tool as well as the Sully fuzzing framework, which he wrote, as well as PyDebug. Um, so that's where I first learned of Peter Menace's work. And then I remember looking at different bug bounty programs out there. Like there are some ethical buyers such as iDefense and ZDI and others where if you, let's say, discover a browser-based vulnerability and you can verify or validate that it's a uh, information disclosure bug or a remote code execution bug, you could then sell it to one of these organizations who would then validate that there is code execution potential and there are different price tags associated with it. And if you've ever heard me lecture in the past, I always talk about this, this horrible year, which is 2014, where Microsoft in June and July came out with two different uh, mitigations against Internet Explorer and Edge. And that was uh, Deferred Free, which became MemGC, and also Isolated Heap. And those two mitigations pretty much killed the majority of exploitable use after free conditions in the browser. And that's when Microsoft started to get really aggressive against this stuff. But during that time, uh, I remember working with Coreland Coder and others where those were some of the big buyers of these different browser-based vulnerabilities. So when I looked that up, Pedram's name kept coming up. And I'm like, wow, this guy started off a lot of this stuff early on before anybody was really talking about the idea of bug bounties and actually getting paid for your work. So uh, that's my history with, uh, with meeting Pedram, and he's spoken for us a couple of times at a, a SAN Summit before, and lives in Austin, Texas, is, is involved in a startup, so I'll let him give a little more information here. Thank you, Steve. Much appreciated. Yeah, I mean, my career really started as a, a teenager in the late 90s, um, growing up in New York City. You know, I got my hands on a copy of Soft Ice and, you know, I would do some some phone freaking, you know, back then there was no smartphone. So if you were calling your friends or calling your family, you were doing it from a public pay phone. Um, and I have it depicted here. If you want to throw on the uh, the screen share, what a, a red box looks like, you know, it was like an off the shelf Radio Shack product that if you swapped out one of the, the timing crystals, you can actually fake the a quarter being dropped into the system. All right, so these were the kind of the, the things, getting access to free software by cracking it with soft ice and getting access to free phone calls uh, by messing around with phone freaking is really what got me into, into the space. Um, and then when I went to, to college at Tulane in New Orleans, you know, I continued kind of hobby hacking. Um, and every time I would find something, I would go report it to the affected department. And I kept hearing this name come up throughout this process of Dave Endler. Oh, you're just like this guy, Dave Endler. Who, uh, who just graduated from, from Tulane. So fast forward to the end of college, 2002 timeframe, and you know, I published a couple of bugs at that point on bug track and full disclosure. You know, these were the mailing lists at the time that were like the de facto. If you found something, this is where you went to go uh, report it for, for public dissemination. And so in the process of, of publishing these reports, uh, this company that was around the startup called iDefense uh, they had come up with the idea. So this Dave Endler character, uh, uh, Mike Sutton, who you know, was last uh, a CISO at Zscaler, uh, and Sunil James, they were all sitting at, at iDefense and they were selling a, an information feed and they were trying to come up with a, an idea for how they could generate you know, new novel data. So they invented the concept of the VCP or the Vulnerability Contributor Program. And to seed it, what they did was they parsed through these mailing lists and they found all the various folks who had contributed bugs to the open source community. And they reached them out, reached out to them with a very simple proposition. Hey, how about next time? Give us the bug first. We'll pay you for it. We'll validate it. We'll deal with the whole vendor disclosure process and we will give you 100% credit. Once it has been publicly patched, you're welcome to put out whatever 
you know, report you want on it yourself. And so I literally get this email as I'm, I'm doing some job hunting from Dave Endler, this name that I was hearing about this whole time at, at college. And I responded saying, hey, this is a great idea for a program. Um, instead of contributing, I'd love to be involved. Uh, he happened to be visiting the school, you know, within in, in you know, short history. Um, and so we spoke and I became the first hire at iDefense to actually receive and validate these vulnerabilities. Um, and that's really how this my whole involvement in, in this world uh, began. And, you know, I'll tell you at the time we were getting some uh, some crappy vulnerabilities, like vulnerabilities in software that had like 500 users on like SourceForge, you know, yeah, FTP servers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Garbage. Like I remember when I was Dino's web server or like abuse, you know, the video game. You know, to which the vendor's response was, you know, abuse should not be run anywhere where you consider security to be important. But really, we were going through the motions of just proving to the community that we will pay. We are going to be honorable. We're going to go through the disclosure process. And it took a few months, but eventually we got our first, you know, interesting vulnerability. If I recall correctly, it was an Apache scoreboard, uh, a non-default setting, but a code execution in Apache. And that really kind of set the stage. Once we put that advisory out, People saw that we were we were legit, um, and that's really how I would say that the the first public above water, you know, corporation sponsored bug bounty started. Yeah, it's fascinating, and like just for those of you who are joining and listening in, or who watch this afterward, the the reason I wanted to put this particular uh, stream together is when I've been teaching or just speaking or whatever, traveling, talking to people. This is it's a very common question that gets asked is how do I sell a vulnerability or an exploit that I've written? What types of things would people be interested in buying? Uh, who are the potential buyers? What do they do with those those exploits? Because not all of them are equal. Some of them are ethical, like what Pedram's talking about now, and they'll work with the vendor to get it disclosed and, and patched before it goes public. But other ones, you know, we'll talk a little bit about what potential use cases are, but uh, it can be all over the map. And there's, there's a price tag associated with these different types of exploits. And Pedram and I were talking yesterday about it and found some pretty interesting new uh, programs out there as well. And there's also a market in one day exploit sales. So I, I've done webcasts or streams on that before where on Patch Tuesday, Microsoft's got the very mature process where Patch Tuesday, the first or second Tuesday of every month, it's been that way since the early 2000s. And they come out, the patches come out and you extract these patches and you diff them. You find the affected DLL or driver or whatever it is, and you diff it against the unpatched version. And that exposes typically a few functions or less that have code changes to them. And the faster that you can weaponize or identify the bug, determine if you can weaponize it, and then actually weaponize it, the more valuable it is. And there are price tags associated with that too. So people like talking about money, and it's a very fascinating area. So that's why I wanted to have Petermon, who is you know one of the... the for, you know, foremost experts on this space and started this whole thing. So, so that was a bit about uh, iDefense and BCP. How about how did a tipping point ZDI come in? You know, so iDefense was was bought by Verisign in 2005. You know, and I'm just I'm not one to work at a big company. You know, I'm I'm on my fourth consecutive, uh, what I would consider startup now. You know, I like to work once a company gets above 200 people. It's just not a space for me. I like to wear a lot of hats. I like to be in the early stages. So VeriSign wasn't a good place for me. I immediately uh, was looking elsewhere. You know, same character, Dave Endler, a uh, very close friend of mine. Uh, he's working over at, at SpyCloud now. Um, he had come down to Austin and he was working at IPS company, Tipping Point, and they were looking to do a similar program. They're like, you know, in, in the case of iDefense, the monetization strategy was pretty direct because the intel that came in, we were bundling into a normalized feed that were being sold to our subscribers around the same time the vendors were getting notified. With ZDI or Tipping Point, the monetization was not direct, right? The idea is, look, we are spending time having to do exactly what you're just describing, reverse engineering patches for the sake of isolating the root cause and then writing detection logic, or in this case, prevention logic. Uh, Tipping Point was the world's first IPS, right? They took the whole IDS model, um, shrank down the time it took to respond and literally put that in line. So. If you see a stream of packets coming and suddenly you, you realize there's enough information that this is some vulnerability that's being exploited, you can cut that stream off and stop it from actually you know, finishing, from actually getting that, that payload or, or triggering the, uh, the, the vulnerability. So very different models, right? On the one, there's a resell of information. On the other one, you're just producing defensive logic. 
And look, this is a time where you know, now we have things like Microsoft Active Protection Program, where if you are, and there are dozens, Inquest is a vendor that's among this, uh, uh, these programs where we get access to the Microsoft bulletins prior to the public patch Tuesday with more information that's shared with the public as well, that gives us opportunity to write well-tuned uh, detection logic. Right. This did not exist during this time frame. So the thought process was, look, if we can get access to more zero day, then we're gonna have better detection logic. So why not just build a program where we're going out there and buying it? So a company approached me and said, hey, do you wanna come down to Austin, You know, rebuild this thing from scratch? Uh, we came up with the name Zero Day Initiative, um, and that's how we launched that program. It was neat because it was like a second revision of it. I got to kind of work on and correct some of the things that I wasn't a big fan of. Uh, we also increased prices, you know, kind of added more to the market that way. And I would say to date, this is probably the dominant non-platform, and I can describe what I mean by that, uh, a bug bounty program out there. Yeah, so let's go back to that a little bit more because there's a question that I get asked all the time, which is like you just mentioned subscribers and they get access to something. So let's say that I was going to sell a type confusion bug against Edge or Chrome and I was to go to one of these two organizations and and make that sale. In the past, I don't get paid for 90 days or something like that because they want to get it patched and things like that. Make sure it doesn't get out there uh, before it's actually patched and I'm not selling it to multiple places. But who, so are, are companies who would use that from an exploitation perspective getting access to it potentially, or is it only uh, defensive companies like you mentioned, people writing detection rules and such or, or other, or like how, how are these companies making their money? Like why is it worth their time to pay me to write an exploit? Sure. You know, on the payment front though, you know, one clarification there, until a contract is made and that money is paid, the IP does not belong to the company. So no vendor disclosure process, no communication with customers. None of that is feasible until there's been an agreed signed contract and the payments have, have you know, changed hands. But you know, it, it depends. And that was one of the things I wasn't the biggest fan of um, you know, with the iDefense model is it's too easy for it to, you're talking about forwarding of an email, right? Like copy pasting of some text. It's too easy for it to, to disseminate. And of course, everyone wants to blame the researcher first and foremost, but it's very feasible that one of your customers might have accidentally or purposefully leaked it, especially if you have organizations like Homeland Security. That's a massive volume of people who have access, who have eyes on on that data, right? That very sensitive data. So it's a very different uh, model. You know, on the tipping point side, sure, it is feasible to break open the box you know, pull out the signatures and start reverse engineering from there to, to you know, you're not, it's not foolproof. It's not a hundred percent going to prevent people from getting access to it, but it's a significant barrier of entry, you know, just in terms of buying the product, violating the terms of services, getting in there, having the talent. And let's not forget detection logic isn't going to tell you the whole story, right? I can know a certain thing is malicious based off of some, you know, buffer sizes, and that's not going to exactly tell me in all cases, what the specific vulnerability is. Though, though clearly it is feasible. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it makes sense if like you're a company that has a product that's a detection product or prevention product that you would buy these, your product then becomes the one that has the ability to detect this stuff earlier than anyone else as it, at the same time it's getting patched. Like that completely makes sense. And um, it's a time saver. I mean, like they're, I believe they are now defunct. Actually, no, I lied. Uh, there was a company called Telus, and you know, way back in the day, talking about like mid two thousands, Telus was around. It's like a telecom company out of uh, Canada. For whatever reason, they had a subdivision that was, you know, very good at at uh, patch diffing and providing you basically what what Map provides for Microsoft and Adobe uh, vulnerabilities for for free. You know, assuming you can pass the bar to to get into the program, uh, these guys were offering as a paid service. Now Trend Micro uh, bought Telus and owns it. You know, Trend Micro also is the owner of ZDI now. They bought uh, all of Tipping Point, so they they kind of have the market covered there in terms of uh, of that data and those those researchers. But just think about how valuable it is to have that that information. Yeah. You know, you don't ha and think about how much time was wasted back then when you have ten different companies competing who did not want to share with one another. Obviously, that's ten different people reverse engineering the same patch, doing the same work. That's valuable human cognition that, you know, for the world is being wasted because they're, they're reinventing the wheel 10 times. Yep, absolutely. And I, like I was mentioning to you yesterday, um, 
there are there are some buyers out there who like if you're an exploitation framework product like Rapid7 and Metasploit or Core Impact, if that's still around, Immunity, Canvas, uh, Saint Exploit. There's a bunch of these different frameworks out there, and and they want to be the one who can say we have more weaponized exploits against CVEs that were privately disclosed because it's a known fact that I would say over 90 percent of the CVEs out there were privately disclosed and were not publicly out there. There's no corresponding public exploit. So if you're a vendor who can say our exploitation framework has 500 exploits written for privately disclosed CVEs that no one else has, that makes you know perfect sense. That's why people would want to go with that product. And um, there are some companies out there that, that will actually buy the one day exploits from you. I, I give this example a lot. I remember one time uh, there was a shopping list given to me by this individual and it was like 20 different CVEs and they were recent ones. And it was like the ones that they the most desired from their customers, the ones that they wanted a corresponding exploit to privately disclose CVEs. And uh, I wrote an exploit for a Wireshark vulnerability. So it was a Wireshark format string vulnerability. Back at that time, the percent %n operator was supported. So Wireshark needs to run its root. So it was a pro it was a protocol parsing vulnerability and you could get root on the box. And it was like, it's only a few thousand dollars, but hey, I, I did it on an airplane. So I mean, it's something you can do instead of watching Lord of the Rings. Um, but uh, I guess let's talk a little bit about some of the other potential, because uh, I want to talk about some of the other bounty programs out there. But also let, let's talk first about uh, some of the other potential buyers. Like you've got companies like Zerodium, for example, who will pay way more money out there uh, than a lot of this. So I remember when Microsoft came out with the security development lifecycle back in early 2000s. And uh, the, the last step of the SDL was to build a vulnerability uh, program, like uh, make it possible for people to feel comfortable disclosing a vulnerability to your organization without the fear of a lawsuit. And so that way they're not just you know releasing it publicly or, or doing something else with it. So creating a corresponding like vulnerability disclosure program. And uh, a lot of companies still don't have that. But the problem in a lot of cases is the companies don't pay as much as some of these third parties out there. And you not only have companies like Zerodium, you've got different proxies out there who work on behalf of intelligence agencies. Like, so do you have any insight as to these potential buyers and you know, what some of these exploits, what they do with some of these exploits? Yeah, sure. You know, I, the way I see the market is there's a couple different sections, right? One is like the direct vendor market. And the first bug bounty ever was Mozilla in the mid nineties offering 500 bucks if you can pop the, uh, the browser. You know, not too long after that, if you remember uh, uh, DJB, um, like DJB DNS, DJB mail, you know, QMail and all this, you know, he had one as well, right? So there, and, and of course now there's tons of them. If you go do a search there, I think actually even Hacker One lists all the various like direct vendor bug bounties. There are maybe a hundred of them. So that's one aspect is going straight to the vendor, right? The vendor is directly monetizing the research that someone is doing and paying them directly, patching it. There's no third parties involved. Then you've got, you know, platform programs like Hacker One is the biggest one. Bug Crowd, Integrity, Yes We Hack, Synac, BugBounty.ch. Um, you know, these are all like your, your classic software vulnerabilities that we're familiar with. And now there's a whole new world too where you've got the, the blockchain um, bug bounties, and those are even more valuable. So like Hack and Proof and Immunify. Uh, my friend Eric Michaud recently launched a company called Unciphered, and they're actually paying for, for end days uh, as well. I think this is a program that's going to be announced in the, in the near future. You know, you, to go back to your, your question about how do you monetize end days, because it's much more difficult to monetize an end day yeah. than it is to monetize a zero day. There's plenty of options uh, for, for plenty of, of avenues for, for O-Day monetization, much less so on, on the end day side. All right, so you've got these platforms and like ZDI is one as well. It's, it's not quite a platform. Some of these platforms are really working with vendors, like a vendor who doesn't want to stand up their own bug bounty program. Maybe we'll go work through HackerOne or Bug Crowd, right? Kind of outsourcing that component. Whereas ZDI is more of like a standalone and to the extent possible operating altruistically. Quick note on that. As part of uh, the ZDI, the day before a patch, any competitors who want information regarding those bugs were allowed to get to get it. And amazingly, only two or three vendors signed up. It always boggled my mind. You know, you couldn't swallow the pride to get access, save your guys' time. We have all this data. We're going to give it to you for free for the you know for the greater good. 
But that was one of the more altruistic points of the ZDI that never really, for whatever reason, uh, took off. And I think since then they've, they've, they've shuttered it. But yeah, tons of different um, uh, uh, programs out there now above water, right? Before 2002, iDefense VCP, it was a handful of vendor programs. Since then, we've got an explosion of platforms. Then the other two markets are what I would call the gray market, where you know, you're working with a reseller. Um, you know, it's, it's probably going through, hopefully going to a friendly government, you know, not one that is um, uh, authoritarian and, and leveraging those wares to, to you know, abuse and spy on and kill journalists. Right? It's kind of like middle manning. Yep. And then there's a black market, right? There, there is a black market for exploits out there. I think in terms of, of valuations, like I think you mentioned in, in your tweet for this talk, like you, the same bug can be worth 10K or, or you know, a couple million, right? So this is the, the order where it goes up. I believe it is vendors, platforms, black market, gray market, right? The biggest bang for the buck is going to be a gray market, though we're seeing some, some competition, Right. Apple's got a two million dollar uh, reward just you know, like yesterday. Chris Rolf of Facebook announced that their uh, zero click for some of their their apps like uh, like WhatsApp is up to 300K now. So like the legitimate above board uh, programs are getting quite competitive. And if you look at the, um, the blockchain ones, I mean, there are guys out there who have made over 10 million dollars on two, three, four blockchain bugs through Immunify. I even have a tab up here actually somewhere if you're curious to. Sure, yeah, sure. Where is this? This is probably, I mean, look at this leaderboard. Right? 13 million in wow. earnings over four paid reports. Man, that's equivalent of like selling a company. That's right? These amazing. Are huge, huge, massive bounties. Something, this is on a level that I've never seen before. Like the blockchain bounties have really taken this to the next level. Granted, fewer people can do this kind of work. You're talking about like NSA style people who are, are, are able to do this level of, of, of math to, to find faults in like the smart contracts. So the, the barrier to entry is a little bit higher, but the reward, as you can see, is, is, is massive. Yeah, that's insane. I haven't seen that before. The $13 million, that's, that is amazing. Wow. Yeah, yeah we see like Zerodium. Uh, they, I think they're the ones that offer like $2.5 million for an Android. Uh, there's $2 million for an iOS. So that's interesting that Apple is now willing to pay the same amount because I believe it's with the Pegasus Project or that group out there that have been releasing a bunch of iOS stuff. I remember when... Zerodium, it may have been Boobin at the time, but Zerodium said, we're, we're temporarily suspending purchasing iOS zero click remote code execution bugs because they had enough. That is scary. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, look, you talk to some of the really big players in this industry, um, in, in the, in the bug bounty industry, and there are, there are groups out there, right? Like there, as time goes on and things get progressively more complicated, it takes longer to discover longer to exploit, you need multiple exploits chained together. You know, I, I remember seeing one of these like Pinkie Pie exploits, it was like 18 chained bugs. I couldn't believe, it. I mean, it's just straight magic. Um, so it's becoming more requisite that you have a whole team that gets together. And there are groups out there where they've discovered whole new bug classes and they will not disclose them because it's just too lucrative. And it's, it's things like that where you'll see sudden flooding of the market and, you know, people have got to close the doors because they just, you know, the, the market doesn't, economics don't make sense anymore. You're not going to pay $2 million for 10 iOS exploits. You need one, maybe a backup. Yeah, I remember when uh, it was Gin, Ginville Coldwin the thing, and someone else at Project Zero uh, found the, the double fetch category, or they called it double fetch, which is a TOC, TOU bug. And they found like over 50 of them against the Windows kernel. And they did a talk, I think, I think it was SciScan maybe over in Singapore, and they disclosed it to Microsoft directly because they were employers of Google at the time. But like, just think about how much money potentially you could have made off 50 or more kernel, like local privilege escalation vulnerabilities. It's insane. I, uh, I remember I sold, the last kernel exploit I sold was, it's been a few years now, but it was against Windows 10. And it was, I sold it for $120,000. And somebody came up to me in a class and said, you sold it for that much, that little, because we would have started you at 500,000 and you probably could have gotten a lot more. And I won't say what company it was, but this was a company on be buying on behalf of US based intelligence uh, yeah. organizations. So that's one of the interesting buyers out there are, like I said, those proxy for intelligence agencies. And we all know, we've heard of people like the Grug before, right? The, there was a talk, I think it was like New York Times or, or something, Wall Street Journal. And 
they did a talk. There's a photo of the Grug sitting in the Dubliner pub in Bangkok with a duffel bag full of Thai bot just hanging out wads and wads of cash. And uh, the idea there is he was a proxy. You could go to him and say you've got something and he would go find the highest buyer potentially, but you don't know who that buyer is, takes a cut, you get the rest of the money and you move on with your life. But like there are some potential problems with who could be buying it. Like you were saying, to keeping track of journalists and stuff. And I, I, I didn't really want to go down this path, but like it could even be something that leads to someone getting physically harmed. Yeah. Depending on who that buyer is. Look at the Jamal Khashoggi incident. You know, the, the, the post mortem uh, news shows that they had spyware in his Android. Right. That's why that cost two and a half million dollars here. Right. That's the kind of tooling that's used to, you know, to silence dissidents, um, you know, to, to gain access. It's, it's that users, people, humans and even companies are not shelling out this kind of capital to leverage unless they're defending their own product. Right. For Apple, it is worth two million to close an iOS uh, RCE because you're protecting your entire pool of, of users. But. Someone like ZDI will never pay two million for something like this. It's just not; it does not make economical sense. But this brings up another interesting point. There is you know, the divide of when you go vendor platform, someone like in between, like like ZDI, you get credit. Yeah. Anyone beyond that, you're not getting credit. And like, is credit worth the the price differential between half a million and one twenty five? Certainly, to some portion of it. You know, people are building careers for themselves, right? This is how you build a name for yourself. You know, going back to the question of how do you monetize end day, it's hard, but you could just publish it. And in that process, you're going to, you're building a resume. You know, one of the greatest things about our industry is that there is sans having access to computer internet. There's no barrier to entry. You don't need to have a, a degree. You don't have to be located in a certain region um, or a certain age. It does not matter. If you're out there, you produce five, six, you know, post patch end days, you're going to get picked up by one of these companies, right? They, they need that kind of talent. So you can kind of prove it to the world um, and, and build a whole career off of it or stay in the shadows and get more money up front. And of course, run the, the risks of knowing that your wares were used to, you know, to beat someone to death. Yeah. I've got, I've got my own thoughts on this, but this is a question that comes up a lot too. I want to hear your perspective or thoughts. Um, a lot of people get nervous around how, like what's the right way to go and try to disclose something. Like, obviously if you're going to go with someone like ZDI, there's a process and you should feel relatively safe doing so. I know some people complain about duplicates and saying that I always get the response back that this has already been discovered by someone else and, and there's no proof available to them. So how do I know I'm not getting ripped off? But the, the bigger thing I was looking at is, Let's say that you want to go for a higher price tag on something. Um, I've seen people tweet out, I've got some zero days against this product and who wants it? And then they start receiving DMs from unknown characters. And so like some people like they asked me to meet them at a coffee shop or they want me to do a, a Zoom session or they want me to just send them the code. Obviously, you don't want to do that. But do you have any thoughts around how you would go about going that path? Yeah, I mean, from, from my perspective, I would never go down... You know, if I were sitting in the shoes of that researcher, I would go, I would, you know, there's the divide, right? You got the gray market, black market, and then you've got the, let's call it the, I'm going to get credit for this market and the, I'm going to be quiet about this market. I would go down the, I'm going to get credit. I don't think it's valuable. You're going to bring in a lot of um, unwanted attention. If you just kind of broadcast it out to the, to the general world, I think it's probably best that you go look at and enumerate all the various markets that exist out there and find what the top dollar is going to be to stay in the I'm going to get credit uh, realm. That, that's my own personal opinion. Um, I don't, you know, I don't judge anybody for doing anything pretty much. Um, but if you're sitting there and selling to friendly governments for top dollar, I mean, that's also valuable too, right? There's nothing wrong with someone working at Lockheed and building cruise missiles, right? It's obviously the military industrial complex is, is one of our biggest industries Actually, it is the biggest industry. The biggest budget in the history of time is the U.S. military industrial complex. And so if a cruise missile costs a million dollars and there's no um, qualms with someone being an engineer working on it, why not sell digital armaments as well? Right? It, it, you're, it's to your side, to your, your friendly uh, side country. So that's OK as well. Really, the black market is what I would avoid at all costs. And it's the sneakiest one. Right? There's no there's no guarantees. You know, one quick comment on the, the duplicate uh, notion. 
Because this is something in my five years of, of um, starting and running the ZDI, I've seen it a number of times. And of course, the first thing that comes to mind is, is someone double dipping, mm -hmm. right? Is someone telling their friend like, hey, let's just get paid twice for this, this bug. And I remember one explicit case where we had an IE vulnerability that was reported to us by three different researchers. But in looking at it, it was clear they found it in three different ways. Huh. Right? It was three different access points to the same core issue. Wow. And we ended up paying for it three times. Right? It wasn't, and part of that is because you want to maintain the trust of the community. And we didn't want to go, we didn't want to deal with the alternative where if we don't buy this, you know, they might go sell it to someone less savory. And I can actually give you an example of that. Um, back in 2009, I gave a talk at um, Echo Party in Argentina. Uh, one of that and Recon are my two favorite conferences, and it was called uh, Mostrame la Guita, which is uh, slangish Spanish for "Show me the money." And I think it's really the first time anybody's ever kind of opened the veil and showed the the prices of all the different uh, the markets: gray market, black market, vendor market, etc. Um, and now I've lost track of what we're going with that. This is. <laughs> <clears throat> that's all right uh it'll come back to you yeah we'll swing back to that <laughs> but but um yeah i was it's funny i, I was go, on the dodgy side of things like not knowing who your buyer is and yes that's absolutely scary uh, i i've definitely had some dms people saying hey let's keep it like hit me up on the proton mail account uh and you know we'll, we'll exchange via monero i'll pay you via monero just give me your address and like here's a way we can and, and i know a guy who is a um what do you call it uh, when they hold it and they don't release it until you uh, like an escrow. Yeah. Like an escrow. Like, so like there's a bug, like an exploit escrow on the dark net and, and this person will hold it and he won't release the funds until it's validated. And I was like, that's like terrifying that there are those types of uh, sales happening. So I know a while ago, and I'm probably going to do a talk on this at some point. I was looking at, um, I was looking at, ransomware and just the per the, what type of malware is available on the dark net for sale because there's all kinds of different dark net markets out there and most of them are selling drugs but there are a lot of them selling exploits and stuff too and, and ransomware and different types of malware kits most of it's junk like i've actually looked at some of this ransomware and i've reverse engineered it and you can um you can just basically get it to unencrypt things it's just not very well done but I think it'd be pretty fascinating to kind of take a dive in there. I'm not saying we should talk about it now, but like go in and look at a session as to what types of stuff is there. Um, so it's just a couple of people saying we were speaking about duplicates in that last one. If, if it re gets your thoughts back, that's kind of how we got I, I remember what I was going to say now. Okay, right? good, good, good. On that, it, it was on that, that process of why do we even pay for that duplicate? So there was an Adobe JBIG2 uh, vulnerability that had come across our desk and we validated it, looked good made an offer and the researcher wanted more, you know, go talk to management, get the approval to go outside the budget, offer it. And again, he's like, actually, I'm getting much higher prices. And we lost the opportunity to buy this book. Right? We just could not compete with whatever markets he was dealing with. Two months later, we see this exploit in the wild. We get a copy of it and we go and we look at it. And literally this guy had his own credit in it, right? Like he is part of the PDF exploit. He had his name and his email address. Whoever bought this thing and rebundled it and shot it out in the, in, in the wild, they didn't even bother changing it or removing it. They just put X's in it because if they, I'm sure they reduced it the length and it broke the exploits, like forget about it. We'll just blank it out. You know, we'll, we'll null it out. But 110% we knew this is the repercussion of us not having made that market price, which is why when that, you know, triple IE discovery came out, you know, we, we pwned up the extra cash just to make sure that Microsoft had the time to, to issue a patch and that we weren't going to deal with the same situation again where we see it out in the wild. Yeah, I, I see the duplicates happening a lot more on the web bug bounty stuff, like the cross-site scripting and requests for all those types of bugs, deserialization bugs. Like a lot more often than the binary exploitation stuff. I've never been told what I've submitted was a duplicate when it comes to binary exploitation. Um, but yeah, a lot of people ask, you know, how do I get more practice in this? I, I always give the, the advice or recommendation to go to exploitdb.com look at the vulnerable programs there, you know that the ones listed there are, are vulnerable. And don't look at the exploit, download the, the vulnerable program, try to find the vulnerability, maybe through fuzzing or static analysis, however you want to do it, try to find it yourself because you know you're not wasting your time because there is one in there. If you exhaust everything and you can't figure it out, then look at the answer, look at the exploit, 
and still exploit it, still try to get it working, but just doing that over and over and over again and kind of starting off simple with those simple FTP servers and such, and then ramping yourself up to some more complex uh, exploits out there because yeah, no one's going to buy these random little things that you see up on exploit DB all the time. Um, yeah. You know, on that note, you know, how do you get in? Cause this is a question I get asked all the time yep. as well. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I repeat exactly what you just said, like take a known vulnerability and go and rediscover it and try different ways of rediscovering it. You know, the thing I always would tell people, especially from the reverse engineering side is, you know, write software, compile yeah. it, and then go take a look at it. Cause then you know what's going in, right? Take some open source software that, and that is compiled and go look at the inputs and the outputs to get familiar with, um, you know, what that looks like. But one that I find is, is more of like a modern day thing and is producing savants left and right is the capture the flag tournaments. Yes. Right. It's reached a point now where, you know, they're using like, you know, V8, right? They're, they're, put, they're taking the JavaScript engine and while they're introducing a bug into it, the exploitation is real, right? Like your heat manipulation and the, the memory butterflies and all this, none of that changes, yep. right? The, the bug might, but if you can build the skill set, and I see plenty of you know, young folks, teenagers, young 20s, who through CTF is how they got really good. You've got like this REPL environment where you're just sitting right inside that, that production um, environment and you can tickle it and play with it. And as you get your skill set uh, better, I mean, that's very valuable. If you look at the, the market, yep. you know, browsers are on the, the upper echelon of what is, what is valuable. It makes sense, right? A lot of the apps that you, the, the vast majority of folks um, uh, are interfacing with they're interfacing with it through a browser. So that choke point becomes something that is scrutinized heavily, both by the vendors looking to protect them and the folks who are looking to, to exploit them to you know, cash in on, on larger bounties. Yeah, which is, which is why the, there's so much focus on mitigating and putting those exploit mitigations on the browsers. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. That was like my bread and butter was, I was browser exploitation for a long time. And then as soon as they introduced, I remember they introduced the ones I talked about, MGC and, and Isolated Heap. And at that time, Ivan Fratrick, at some point after that, released through Project Zero, Microsoft, it broke the disclosure timeline deadline of 60 days, and uh, it went public. The trigger file went public. So this particular trigger was a use after free vulnerability, and there was a corresponding type confusion RCE bug that you could put together and have ASLR bypass and all that. And uh, I, the, the, the neat thing is, at the time, string or text allocations were not protected by those mitigations. The, they were only focusing on uh, browser objects like span and div and uh, buttons and tables, you know, all the elements inside the, uh, the browser. And that's what was being protected because those are the ones that were typically involved. But there's all these different attributes and text allocations that have to do with, as again, associated with the object allocations that were not protected and you could still get used after free going. So I remember Ivan Frederick released that and then I took that and used it in gray hat hacking. I weaponized it and documented the process, put it in gray hat hacking fifth edition. And then my, my theory was, which is not a very novel theory, but it was if, if you find my, my bad analogy always is if you're out walking in the park and you find a gold coin on the ground, are you just going to pick it up and go about your day? Or are you going to go get a shovel and you're going to dig assuming there might be more gold? My theory was, I had a browser fuzzing farm. I could take these trigger files that found real bugs and assume that there might be more vulnerabilities in that area because a lot of times there are microsoft and history repeats itself constantly and often cases they will patch something and a couple cross references away is that exact same bug that they just don't bother going and fixing or looking for and so fuzzing in the area where a real vulnerability was discovered is a great way to find new bugs and that's that's another tip i would give out there someone's asking um do you remember finding your first wild bug um, you know, funny enough, I was actually on the private chat side of this, uh, stream yard is new for me. So I didn't see any of these comments until, until just <laughs> now, uh, before we dive into that, you know, just to expand on what you were saying, this is one of the reasons why it was imperative at the ZDI that we had a top notch team. So, you know, we had five researchers, myself included, and not only were we leveraging every Wednesday night, we would skip the night of sleep. We'd have Wednesday all nighters. We'd pick a target. Sometimes a vendor that had pissed us off in their responses and every single one of those sessions in the morning, we had some O'Day against the, the vendor. So it was imperative for us to have the team and the chops to do it. Um, and one of the big reasons was exactly what you're describing. Every single vulnerability that came in 
we started digging around it. And very, very commonly, very commonly, we would find other related bugs. And even after they patched, we would go look at it again because sometimes you could patch gap. It wasn't you know, sufficient. The bug is still there. Yep. So as a, as a means of saving some costs on uh, the ZDI dollars that were going out, because it's not unlimited. We can't just, you know, there's, there's some justification that for, for budget that goes on there. You can't just buy everything. Yep. You know, there's no direct monetization strategy there for, for a tipping point. Um, we're trend micro today. So we would try and eliminate those things before, you know, let's say we report the bug to Microsoft, they patch it. Now everyone's looking around there and we get 10 new submissions. Our goal was to ensure that we were really weeding out that area and getting all the bugs patched so we didn't end up coming back to it and having to, to repay for, for discoveries there. Um, and then one more comment on the, on the duplicate. You know, I think a lot of the duplicates is also based off of inspiration from tools, talks, papers that go out, right? Like people are generally, you know, we're not all unique snowflakes. So it's not uncommon for folks to be looking at the same targets with the same tools and the same recent knowledge that they might have picked up from some black hat talk. Right. So that was, I think, one of the reasons why um, when I first got into the business, I would not have expected to see as many duplicates as I did. But it was, you know, it was tangible. It was something that was a substantial. You know, believe it or not, I actually don't remember discover what my first uh, in the wild discovery is. That just shows you what age does to a, to a man. I'm 42 now, so it, it would have been back when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. <laughs> yeah, I think I think mine was probably on some old video game on you know using a hex editor and being able to do something that causes you know more of a fault injection kind of situation that would get you to that cheat on the game. <laughs> yeah. I see someone else is asking about, um, you know, how long it take you to feel comfortable with the tool set and skills in cybersecurity? Never. It's a, yeah. it's a never ending. Um, there's always more to learn. There's always someone out there who's going to be smarter than you. Um, it's a constant. And that's why I love it. You know, I always tell people, I can't wait to go back to InfoSec as a hobby. I will do this forever. Like I'll take my kids Furby apart and, and hack things into it. If I'm not yeah. doing this for, you know, for, for livelihood's sake. Um, it's that, it's that, uh, thirst for knowledge and and just taking something apart and figuring out how it works like that is what drives me at the end of the day yeah we we do an iot hacking night sometimes uh, at sans conferences and it's really it's really interesting i remember this one individual oscar tejeda and this other guy petrovsky they found a, a couple of vulnerabilities but one was in this um smart pet thing it was a stuffed animal that was bluetooth lte enabled so no authentication required and they found a hidden command that you could, let's say this, th the idea behind this uh, stuffed animal was, let's say you're a parent and you're traveling, you could through your phone say, you know, hey, I hope you had a good day at school, love you, have a good night. And then on the child's stuffed animal, the little heart light blinks and then they can push the button and they hear the audio from the parent. Uh, they really, they figured out that you could connect to it, issue a hidden command and you could record as a microphone inside the house from outside the house, which is hmm. pretty awesome. Neat stuff like that we we're finding, but that's like another area to go and do bug hunting because on, on a pr prior stream, I talked about exploit mitigations and also with Connor McGar, we talked about some of the mitigations and things like um, shadow stacks and control flow enforcement technology and HVCI and all these other ones are really uh, upping the game. It's, it's much, much harder. Thankfully, that's not turned on by default. Like for example, shadow stacks and control flow enforcement technology, that's not on by default because most processors don't support it yet. So if you go in and look at exploit guard on Windows 10 or 11, it's probably off. And until we get to a point where most systems, and, and they did that same thing with data execution prevention. That came out on XP service pack two, but they didn't turn it on by default until like Vista or later. But yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll come on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there's one other thing I was going to say. I know we're going to wrap it up here in a moment, um, but uh, there's something else I was going to say that someone asked. Oh, well, somebody asked if I was going to start all over. In fact, I think next week, probably next Friday or the Friday after during the holiday time, I'm going to do a stream where I'm going to talk about exactly that, just kind of how I got my start and how I think you should probably do that differently today or what some of the things will be the same. I talked to some people who came out of like Dakota State University or RIT and some other great schools for computer security. And most of them say things like, it's not that the instruction or the professors or the material is so great. It's, it's like Pedro was saying, you get a team of smart people. And instead of going out and partying, these people were staying up all night and they're just hacking away. I mean, think about a, think about a vulnerability like SIG Red. That's that well-known DNS bug that was discovered by someone at Checkpoint a couple of years ago or less. I can't remember exactly, but it was not too long ago. 
they pretty much said, let's identify a semi-public or public service, which you're limited to mail, DNS, web, and a couple others. And let's look for a vulnerability there because if there's a vulnerability there, it's gonna be lucrative. And so I did a talk at Hackfest uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was just this ad hoc talk. I talked about, actually, let me ask you, Petter, and see if you, uh, if you answer this the same way I would. When you think about all the functions out there that are often involved in vulnerabilities, is there one function or two functions that come to mind? Like they always seem to be there involved in somebody's binary exploits or, or vulns? I mean, no wrong answer. If we go back to the, you know, the, the original, you know, back to, to the old school, it's going to be some kind of like sir copy, mem copy kind of thing. Yeah, mem copy. So you said it, mem copy. Mem copy is still there. It's never going to go away in our lifetime unless Rust takes over the world. And what they did, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I can almost guarantee you that they said, let's go pick on mem copy because mem copy is always involved. And they looked at the import address table of DNS.exe. They saw memcopy. They looked at the cross references. There were like 50 or 60 calls to memcopy. And some of the names of the symbols, the functions were like sig wire read, sig wire write, all these read write functions. And they said, well, let's figure out how the size argument is being calculated because oftentimes for memcopy, it's dynamically getting calculated often through something the user is sending. And that's how they discovered it. So Picking on a function like that is a great place to start. Uh, you you will find bugs that way. Yeah, and a more modern day equivalent of it is, man, it was I forget what the um, it was in recent history. It was a college team. They were doing a it was a Chrome hacking competition, and they they talked about it was really neat. I should find it and and you know add it to this uh, chat chain at the very end of this. But they first sat out going about like the fuzzing method and and they banged their head on the wall for a while. Then they switch up their, their approach. Like, well, let's go look at the documentation and let's read the documentation for all the JavaScript functions and isolate the ones that have a side effect. And that's what they started with. Looking, for, looking at every single function that can have a side effect, let's go tinker with that because we know there's going to be some, uh, there, there's an opportunity there for, for an error that's going to allow us to get some kind of uh, memory corruption that's going to be exploitable. So literally they start from the documentation to yeah. go find you know, the modern day men copy to go find what should we go focus on? Like here is a function that you know, by nature of being in the browser realm, it's going to be interesting. So let's go look around there. You know, I recall you know, during the times where I was doing, and like for me, my binary level auditing stopped at, at 32 bit. Like when you say IOT, that excites me because if I'm ever gonna get back into uh, um, any kind of like hands-on uh, binary auditing, I don't, I don't have the patience for 64 bit. I'm going to go to some IOT that's going to give it to me in, in an address space that I can actually, you know, manage in, in, in my brain. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's funny. I remember, yeah, yeah you got to take the jump, got to take the jump at some point. Um, there's a few more questions coming. I know, again, I want to wrap it up. I know Petter's got to get back to work, I'm sure. Um, but uh, somebody's talking about insurance. That, that makes me think of one other quick story. Like I tell this story a lot when I'm teaching, but I used to, I used to, for whatever reason, when I was on planes taking flights was when I would do a lot of this stuff because I was flying a lot to like Melbourne, Australia and, and Amsterdam. And like these are long flights. So you can either watch the Lord of the Rings trilogy or you can actually do some hacking on the plane. And uh, I would go and download different trialware and just do those techniques we're talking about. Look at mem copy calls, stir copy calls and like find them. And uh, I would weaponize things, get a proof of concept going, disclose it to the affected vendor and say, here you go. Um, I need to track this with you. I'm a researcher. I'm, I'll sign an NDA. I mean no harm. I'm a good person. And, and some of them still get upset with you. And I remember a couple of days after I submitted this disclosure to a company, a lawyer is who responded to me and they threatened me and said, cease and desist. You know, what are your intentions? And all I, I responded back and I needed to get a lawyer. So I had to pay out of my pocket money to deal with a lawyer to actually get my back. And, and then we had a call. The CEO was on there basically saying, look, I understand after we looked at you up, uh, you're, you seem like a good person. Your intentions aren't bad. But understand from our perspective, you sent us an email on a Saturday and you told us that our product is remotely exploitable. We're on our fifth round of funding, if you know what that means, they said. And we have clients like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman. And uh, what are we supposed to think? You know, like that made sense to me. But, but at that point, for me, it was like, I'm not bothering with that anymore. Um, and that's, that's why a lot of people use handles and stuff. I remember that guy got a gag order against him from the FBI with a BGP vulnerability at Black Hat or DEF CON many years ago. 
So it, look, that's one of the reasons why people will go to the program. Uh, we have at the yep. ZBI, we dealt with like very aggressive vendors. You know, we had in-house legal at Tipping Point um, and they were like, they were a, a stone throw away because we were having conversations. I remember we, there was, it was a very silly bug, um, but someone reported to us and, and we, it was in serious um, satellite XM radio. This was, I forget what the two big XM radio providers were, but they were about to merge. And so when we sent out this bug report, these guys threw the gauntlet at us because they thought we were trying, they were accusing us of trying to manipulate the market. Like you guys should take a look at our website and see that this is a, one of like, at this point, two or 3000 bugs that we've disclosed. Yeah. Believe me, we have no intent of doing that, but that's why the researcher came to us. He did not want to deal with um, the litigious aspect of these vendors. You know, they're just, kind of vendor shaming we, we would report bugs sometimes and they would ask us hey what's your customer code who's your account rep I'm like you know we don't have one we found it through the trial software as as you're saying right someone reports the bug maybe they found it you know on site they were you know a, a hacker that has access to it in his in his office and he's just tinkering with it finds it so for us we'd have to go get a trial um just to get access to the the binary to do this this validation I'm like, well, we're not a customer. Does that affect at all the value of the information that we're telling you? Would you, yeah. do you only accept vulnerability reports from customers? Because that doesn't make any sense. And I'm sure your customers would not find that, you know, entertaining or amusing. Yeah, I remember a guy uh, who found a vulnerability in FireEye. He had like four zero days and he was trying to disclose it to FireEye and they were coming back and just ignoring him apparently. So finally he got frustrated after many months and he released one on Twitter. He said, here's one for free. I've got three more. Who wants to buy them? suddenly FireEye Legal is interested. <laughs> and uh, I think that was the one where Google uh, got involved and got his back and was like, you know, you can't go after these researchers and they're people are going to find it anyway. You want to be friendly and let them disclose it to you responsibly. Um, but that's a whole other thing. But any uh, any final words? So where, where, real, real quickly, where are you working now? What are you doing now? Um, company, you know, this is my, as I mentioned, fourth back-to-back -back startup. It's called inquest.net. Uh, you know, we are user-based security, web, email, uh, predominantly, we're doing file-based analysis at scale, right? So a, a big difference in how I used to think when I was more offensive is I had the microscope on a very tiny piece of code for a very long period of time. You know, now that I'm more on the defensive side, I see things in a lot more scale, right? I'm looking at large volumes of, of, of malware and looking at campaigns as they come up and down. So very, very different mentality and mindset, though my love still sits on the offensive side. Um, and that's why, you know, I sit as an advisor for Exodus. Um, that's, you know, some of the, the former ZDI guys founded that company. I just, I like that mindset, that lateral thinking yeah. mindset. I crave talking to offensive security folks. Yeah, for sure. It's funny how builders and breakers go back and forth a lot too. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, I'll go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, coming up, I've got in early January, January 6th, I think it is. I've got um, someone on Jonathan Ryder on talking about uh, developing Windows implants, so how to write custom tooling to modify implants so it doesn't get picked up. I've got Robert M. Lee coming on the week after that to talk about ICS hacking from Dragos. And then I've got Chompy coming on the week after that to talk about um, how she goes about finding zero days and weaponizing stuff. So a lot of good talks coming up and more after that. I've got a mobile hacking one coming up shortly after that as well. So um, hopefully hopefully I'll continue to find amazing people like Pedram who will share their knowledge and come on. But uh, aside from that, everyone have a great weekend and a great holiday. If uh, we're not on. In thank you very much. And thank you to the audience for uh, taking the time. I appreciate it. Yes, Cheers. thank you so much. See you.